here you can uh, unmute your video okay, okay. shall we open of course okay so very good evening uh, warm welcome to all thanks for your uh, continuous support uh, for the skill fest uh, webinar series uh, on behalf of jia group of institutions it's my pleasure to welcome you all for uh, today's webinar on introduction to the world of cyber security uh, as we know the cyber security uh, is the practice of uh, securing network systems and any other uh, digital infrastructure from malicious attack with the uh, cyber crime damages uh, projected to exceed a staggering of uh, 6 trillion us dollar by 2021 it's no wonder uh, bank uh, technical companies hospital government agencies and just about uh, every other sector are investing in uh, cyber security infrastructure to protect their business practices and uh, the millions of customers that they uh, trust them with the data uh, so we have uh, one of the young and energetic uh, cyber security specialist uh, mr shiram swaminathan who lives in uh, dublin ireland it's my honor and privilege to welcome our guest on behalf of jia group of institutions and all the participants it's my pleasure to welcome you shiram uh, before uh, getting into the session the, the few instruction uh, uh, need to know uh, one uh, so at the end of the session we will uh, provide you feedback uh, or uh, certificate link i request every uh, participant uh, fill up the feedback form and uh, i request uh, the participants to type uh, your name in the capital letter and uh, you can provide a valid email id and the second thing uh, because the certificate you can uh, receive a certificate within uh, four to five working days uh, sometimes even today or tomorrow the maximum time of uh, four to five days and uh, the technology used here uh, is uh, purely rely on uh, the local bandwidth okay. and uh, if you have any kind of audio or uh, video issues uh, just you can click a reconnect button uh, so that you can uh, connect with the webinar room and uh, suppose if you are uh, if you are closing the window or gone out of this uh, webinar room uh, again you have to register and uh, you can uh, connect with us uh, by clicking the webinar link and uh, if there is any uh, technical issues uh, from our side uh, we will back in 20 to 30 seconds or so don't go anywhere okay you can uh, stay back in the same room. and uh, we will take the questions at the end so if you have any uh, queries uh, you can please type the questions in the uh, question and or uh, the, the chat box okay you can select uh, the few more uh, so that we will uh, get the questions uh, separately uh, with this note, uh, I am very glad to introduce our uh, today's speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Sriram Swaminathan. Uh, Mr. Sriram Swaminathan has completed his undergraduate program in uh, Computer Science and Engineering from Anna University, Chennai, and his uh, master's program in uh, Digital Investigation and uh, Forensic Computing from University College of Dublin, Ireland. He decided to pursue his uh, career in cybersecurity during his uh, second year of undergraduate program. Uh, shortly after uh, graduating, he obtained uh, the certifi certi uh, certi uh, certificate called uh, Certified uh, Ethical Hacker. Uh, he received a fantastic offer from uh, Bank of Ireland on the day he graduated from the University College of Dublin. Uh, since completing his undergraduate degree, he had the opportunity to meet uh, and learn from various experts in the field of cybersecurity and forensics. To say a few, uh, Mr. Pavel uh, Gladyshi, who worked with uh, Interpol and Europol, and Mr. Uh, Jackie Fox, uh, who is uh, head of cybersecurity and IT forensic practice at uh, Delight. His current work position allows him to work with the industry experts with uh, uh, and almost uh, every day. He is going to share the insight of a student who has recently turned to a working professional in the field of cybersecurity and its uh, various roles uh, which may not always be articulated when the topic of cybersecurity is discussed. A uh, great pleasure to have you for the day, Sriram. Uh, with this uh, brief introduction, on behalf of all the participants, uh, we welcome you to present. Over to Sriram. Thank you, sir. Um, just, uh, just a quick check. Can everybody hear me OK? Um, if I can just get a yes or OK on the chat, that would be great. Uh, type yes, uh, can be able to hear Shira. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm getting a yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, I think I think we're okay to start. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining me during this live session today. Uh, as Kumran said, I, I graduated fairly recently, only in 2016, graduating year of 20, graduating batch of 2016, and uh, the reason why I wanted to agree to this uh, webinar is because cybersecurity is is basically the king of today's world. If if cybersecurity isn't focused on, a company could get into some serious problems. So there are a lot of misconceptions about cybersecurity and a lot of missed details about cybersecurity that isn't really discussed about. Uh, so what I want to do is use this presentation, use this session to, to, to basically give some information on that. So with that, um, I, I have a fairly decent presentation. Um, hopefully I'll start that off. And obviously, if you have any questions, please uh, enter that in the chat and um, Kumansal will record all the questions. And at the end of the presentation, uh, I will try to address all your questions. Thank you. Sorry. Right. So what is actually, let me just close, let's turn off my video, try and save some bandwidth. So what is cybersecurity? Uh, like Kumran said, it's basically protecting all systems, uh, people from external attacks, malicious attacks. It, it's mostly digital um, attacks that happen uh, when it's related to cybersecurity. Um, but instead of saying people or systems, I want to use the term entity where it could be a person, a group of people. It could be an organization. It could be hospitals, your railways, your airports anything that has any kind of data that can be used um, to either carry, carry out malicious uh, attacks on the company. So let's say somebody compromises a hospital's data. That would basically be really bad because health information is one of the highest classifications of data. So you wouldn't want to lose that. That's reputational damage and potentially financial damage. Uh, so an entity, uh, Protecting an entity from external attacks digitally is cybersecurity, is the practice of cybersecurity. Now, the best way to explain what cybersecurity exactly can be done, uh, cybersecurity covers, uh, I want to go through this, this hypothetical scenario. So let's say we have a company A, right? Um, Amazon, for example, why not? They have a fancy website. It has all the functionalities. It has, it's bug free and everything works fine. It's super popular. Everybody uses it. And they also have their mobile application that has all the functionality. It's bug free. It works fine. It's really popular. Basically, everybody who has a smartphone has the application on their phone. But one of the main questions that need to be asked is, is it secure? Um, and where company, where companies don't focus on this question, some really, really bad things can happen. So I, I know I skipped through the uh, previous slide. So what I want to do now is, uh, before I go into the, the stored XSS example, I want to start this video. I want to play this video to just give you an idea of what could potentially, um, what could be one of the attack vectors of uh, that, that is phased in cybersecurity. So I'll start the video. Uh, it's a four minute video, so it's fairly short. Uh, once that's done, I'll move on to the other slides. I have the decrypt key. Mark, we have a big problem. The ransomware was just to distract us. They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Walla Cards is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly the two The Nasdaq million. closed lower today, led by Walla Card, which was down 14% on news that their recent data breach may be far worse than the company originally stock announced. fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information, all the financials, all the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. 
I was paid to do a job, and I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. Okay, so uh, for I, I know I saw that a few of the participants were having audio issues. So what I'll do is I have shared with Kumaransar a bunch of the bunch of links that I want to share with participants. So at the end of this this presentation, Kumaransar will share those links with you. So you can you can watch them at your at your own free time. Some of them are demos. Some of them one of them is this video. So uh, if you're having issues now, I will share that. Uh, later and hopefully you can you can watch it at your own time, right? So for anybody who wasn't able to follow that, what that basically was is a quick four minute video, four and a half minute video of what it takes to for a company to fall victim to a ransomware attack. If some if anyone here doesn't know what a ransomware is, it's basically where a, a hacker, a malicious person, gets access to all your company's files encrypts them so that makes it unavailable to use for anybody and unless you pay them money through bitcoin which basically cannot be traced your files will be lost forever and once you pay that money they will give a decryption key and you can use that to get access to your um, files again now one of the other things that was called out in that video is even though you were given the even though you were given the actual decryption key, during that lockdown time, all your sensitive files were transferred over to a server, and that hacker now has all your files. Um, and again, uh, as that lady on the, in the video was saying, she doesn't care that the, she doesn't care that somebody else actually got access to them and published them online, uh, and because of that, stocks crashed and whatever. According to them. Doesn't matter. They got paid to extract files. They've done that. Their job is done. It's, it cannot be traced back to them for the most part. Uh, I'll get back to this one specific point at a later time during the presentation, but that was basically the gist of the video. So um, I want to go back to the slide that we're currently on right now. Um, going back to company A, their, their fancy website, their mobile and all the good stuff. So. What I showed you was one attack vector, right? So that's that's a ransomware attack. Sure, that has become popular in the past three years. That's fine. But there are so many more attack vectors. Attack vector is basically any way that you can use to, to compromise a system or exploit a vulnerability. It could be a mobile device, a web application, it could be a web server. Whatever you can basically try and attack, it, it can be called an attack vector. Now, um, let's take an example. Uh, again, I'm going to cover a scenario. Um, I will share a video, a demonstration, a really good one, uh, with you guys uh, uh, once this presentation is over, so you can actually get a good understanding of how easy this is. Uh, well, it, I wouldn't call it easy. You still need to know what you're doing, but still, how how effective this actually is. So let's say the fancy website didn't really focus on security. They just wanted to make sure that it was out and available as soon as possible, and they kind of slacked on security. Uh, assuming that this, <coughs> sorry, assuming that this website um, does not have proper input, input validation, there could be one of uh, there could be an attack that we used called the stored cross-site scripting. The reason it's called XSS is book is because you know it's, it's cybersecurity. Everything's called fancy. So XSS stands for cross-site scripting. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, um, I, can, I can link a, yeah, if you, at the bottom of the slide, there's the OWASP top 10 link that I've, uh, I've shared, I've uh, entered there. So you can go in, read that. It's basically one of the most common vulnerabilities that is found on websites. So, right, so assuming that one of the, this, this company A's website has XSS in there. Um, so we have company A, their website, let's call it, let's call it fancy website, and then there is me, a malicious actor, and I have a website B, right? So what happens is I have some malicious code on my B website, 
that will automatically run uh, basically a worm, which uh, the moment somebody visits their website, um, you've always heard stories of how, oh, don't go to this website, you know, it has virus. That's basically it. If you go to that website, you automatically are in the process of being attacked. It's an active mechanism. So what happens here? Um, I look, uh, I see that company A has released this brand new website. Everybody's using it. Basically, it's prime target. Okay, so everybody's using it. I want to look into this and see what can be done here. So I do a quick scan of the website, you know, use SSL lab, see what kind of um, encryption they use, what what um, what kind of checks they've put in place, see if any of the functionalities have any vulnerabilities open, see if they've done any coding mistakes where this can be exploited, things like that. So I identify that this website has stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, so once that's done, what I do is basically in any of the entry forms. So ent uh, entry form is where a user can actually input data. So if there is a comment section, you can enter a script, which basically says uh, point to the source, and that source will be my website. So it's it'll be pointing to company uh, website B. So website A now has a direct link to my malicious website B. Um, sorry, I'm just saying, could I use a board or medium to write or draw graphically so that it'd be more easier to be in your flow? Yeah, I can try that. Sorry, say again? Sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Right, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, I don't, um, I can try that. Uh, however, I'm not sure if it would mess with the actual presentation itself. Um, again, what I'll do is I will send you a video that basically covers this exact scenario, and it would actually have, it'll be a demo, basically. So uh, I, my apologies if it's not straightforward uh, when I'm presenting it now, but when you do watch the video, hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, right, so Moving on, um, website A now, ha now has a direct link to website B. Now you, as a user, visit website A, and what happens is you get redirected to website B. Now, for some reason, you don't know why, you clicked on company A, and for some reason, you're in company B. Now, for anybody who knows how a computer system works, is anything that gets executed that needs to be displayed gets loaded onto your memory, your random access memory. Um, what happens here is my malicious website B is now loaded onto your memory. And that basically means that your, your system now has malicious code that is propagating through it. And I can basically launch a command and control attack. What command and control is, is um, if I launch a code, um, I can basically take over your entire system. I'd be able to get all your user credentials. Um, I can even um, run a keylogger. And let's say you visit your banking website. So if you visit SBI, for example, and you type in your credentials, I will have an exact type button press of, uh, of every keystroke, sorry, uh, that you, you did uh, when you were entering those credentials. So now I have your bank details. I have your email account, passwords, and all that good stuff. So that is, it's just a seven step process. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's very possible. Um, now, this is a significant issue that uh, went unaddressed for a long time. And obviously, there were validity checks that, were, that had to be put in place. You have your uh, OWASP top 10, which is basically one of the standard approaches, standard checks that need to be done when you're building a, a, an application or a solution. So hopefully this this make made some kind of sense to who people who are listening here. If you want more information, you can go to the oauth.org page. They're a they're an organization that basically compiles the top ten list of vulnerabilities that is found in every single website website or majority of the websites who don't implement proper controls. So that, that, that is a scenario, right? So to avoid this, um, to avoid your data 
from being captured by me, what could this company have done? Um, I'll get to, I'll get to that point in just a second, but I want to focus on this slide now. Um, so hackers can attack users in nine out of ten web applications. So think about that for a second. In your everyday day-to-day -day use, you probably visit um, your your Facebook, your Google, um, YouTube, Twitter, whatever, what have you. Uh, most of these popular sites do have decent controls in place. Um, I'm not saying they're bulletproof. There's always some new, something new that's going to be found every day. Uh, but a lot of the other sites, uh, the not so popular ones, they would probably have Okay, uh, they would probably have um, n not not exactly robust controls in place, right? So, if nine of the ten web applications can be attacked, then there's a good chance that if they are successful, that means you, the user, are in a severe risk of your having your data stolen, of of being a victim to a cyber attack, basically. Um, unauthorized access to applications is possible on 39% of websites, which basically means you would be able to gain control of an admin console, if you will, and that would allow access to your database, get access to user information, and then again, same thing, taking user information and you resulting in being in a victim of cyber attack. Uh, most of the breaches were personal data uh, or credentials. Personal data is basically your birthday, your name, your email, your um, address, where you work, things like that, and credentials, your username, password for your banking application, your emails, uh, any other website that you use that needs authentication, that would be credentials. So that's, that's, that's how bad um, the, the online world is at the moment. Uh, for a common user, these would be really, really bad numbers. Sorry. Yep. Right. So, although the online world is really bad, um, the number of vulnerabilities found on websites has gone down significantly. So, if, if you look at this um, graph here, it basically shows that 2015, there were 70% high rated findings. So, every finding, uh, every vulnerability is rated either critical, high, medium, or low. Now, criticals is usually used within organizations, so it doesn't doesn't it doesn't match for this chart. But just um, just just think of it as um, highs and criticals are the same thing. Basically, it's really bad if it does get exploited, right? So, 2015, 70 percent had high rated findings. So, most of the OWASP top 10 findings were there, and 30 percent were medium. There is not even lows. But on the bright side, 2019, 50%, that 70% came back to 50%. And the 30% went up to 39, which isn't great. But it does, it is really good news that the highs have gone down and there are, uh, the mediums have gone down to, uh, mediums have been split into mediums and lows, if that makes sense. So this, the posture is increasing. The security posture is definitely improving. But 50% and 39% is still a lot, lot of findings. Um, so uh, this is something that I that that I put together yesterday. Uh, so I st initially started off with just six that I that I was thinking of covering in this presentation, and then I went, oh wait, that's just not enough. We need more. Um, I need this, 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 so I have three more added in there. And then I went, oh, wait, can't wait, I need a few more. So I had three more in there. And at three o'clock in the morning, this is what I ended up with. Now, to be to confirm, this is not the final list. By no means, this comprises of everything in cybersecurity. This is just a list. Uh, there's definitely a lot of things that I couldn't add in purely because I didn't have space. So if you look at it, cybersecurity, if you think of it as the king, there is threat intelligence, vulnerability management, 
ethical hacking, security operations, forensics, cloud security, cyber awareness, data loss prevention or DLP, network security, information security, cyber risk assessment, SSDLC, and identity access management. That is a lot to take in. And fortunately, it's, it's too much to cover during this session. So what I aim to do is um, try and cover uh, some of these topics. Now, obviously, if you need more information, you can always reach out to me through LinkedIn or if you know me by personal means uh, that way. Um, but uh, in this slide there, I've, pres I've provided a link to a Norton website where basically what, it describes what is cybersecurity and what you need to know. That covers off what uh, what are the types of cybersecurity, what are the types of attacks. It, it's a good um, initial read for anybody who's interested. And obviously, if you, if you think that, okay, that's, that's good, but I want to learn more, there are more links that I'll provide towards uh, as we move along the presentation. So uh, take your time to read that for a second. So it goes... Uh, Right, so this is a comic that I found was pretty apt for a lot of the companies that don't take security seriously. Um, so let's say you're working in an organization and you have a product that's coming up. So you have a meeting and you go, okay, cool. Uh, we have this, we have a design in place. We want to do this. This is the budget. We have timelines, blah, blah, blah. And all that's good. And there's a security guy who says, hey, for security, we need to do something about this. But obviously, we don't have the time or budget for it, and we need to get the project off the ground first. Um, and then the project is almost done, still nothing done, and the project moves on. Now, your website or your project is now live. It's been uh, active for so many days. People are using it. Still nothing's done. But the problem is, if you haven't actually actively tested um, the security posture of your solution, your project, then there is 100% chance that somebody out there uh, in the world will try to attack it, and if it is vulnerable, will take it down. So that's that's a for sure uh, means of basically ruining your entire organization. It's reputational damage, and if you're handling financial data, that's financial damage as well. Um, sorry, uh, I see there are a few questions that are coming in. Um, I will get to them towards the end of the presentation, so I'm sorry if I'm not responding to you um, now. Right, so um, like I mentioned, there is too many, there are too many topics to cover, so I, I will try to cover a few of them uh, in this presentation, and uh, one of the first things that I wanted to talk about is um, SSDLC. Uh, now, anybody who's, who studied software engineering um is they they know about uh, software development life cycle we've all seen it we've all uh, we all know the models we've all drawn sorry uh so can you hear me i see that a few people are saying that the audio stopped fine it's not a problem you can go ahead okay um yeah so we, we've all heard the model we've all waterfall and all that good stuff right uh that's just a model that you follow when you develop a, a, any solution, like uh, a software, uh, an application infrastructure, whatever it may be, that is that follows SDLC. What is SSDLC? It's Secure Software Development Lifecycle. It's the exact same as SDLC with secure. It's just that there's security involved in every step. Um, right, a lot of people are saying that the audio is not working. Yes, it's audible. It's not a problem. Uh, okay. So, if you have audience, if you have any uh, audio or video problem, please uh, click the connect button uh, so that you will uh, resume the audio and video. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So it's basically SDLC, but with security. Uh, it's also referred to as DevSecOps or SecDevOps. If anybody is who who's, uh, who is working as a developer, they might have come across this term, and you possibly might have uh, might already be involved in this. 
But basically, what it is is when you have a when you're raising a project, when you're standing up a project, there is oh, uh, when you're standing up a project, there is the design phase that's that that goes in. That is basically the first step of this project. So sorry, second step. The first one is the requirement phase. Um, when you start the design, you sit down with the actual uh, with a security architect or enterprise security architect who will work with the devs, who will work with the technical um, architect, and will come up with a secure solutions or secure controls for your design. So let's say you want to build a website and have XYZ functionality in that. That security architect will look at functionality X and go, okay, so what are the secure controls that you have here? Okay, you don't have anything. Cool. So for X, I want A, B, C security controls there. And for Y, A, B, C, Z, A, B, C. So you make sure that every functionality uh, that is that is on your solution is secure. And that basically helps to avoid that company A scenario that I was talking about. When you integrate security into the design process itself, when you build with this with security in mind there is no way for well there's always a possibility but uh, ideally there would be no um, no open security breaches that you would be uh, vulnerable to so um uh, as you can see in the slide i've said security is integrated in design um once you have a working working version of your application you test it in a test environment so basically you separate it from your actual public live environment. Uh, you test it again and again for your functionality and for security. And you will obviously, if, if, during the initial build, you'll have bugs, you'll have vulnerabilities that are identified. So you give back, give that back to the development team. They fix that. You put it into test again, start testing it functionality and security again and again. Same thing goes over and over and over until you have a solution which you can actually put out into the world and it wouldn't be taken down immediately, taken down as in compromised immediately. Um, and obviously, even if you think that you have tested it multiple times, before you actually deploy into your production or live environment, you always have to do a penetration testing. It's similar to a regression testing that developers do for their applications and solution. Uh, you need to do a final penetration test before you actually deploy because you never know. Uh, some new vulnerability might be found yesterday, um, but your most recent test was from a week ago. So your most recent test would not have that new vulnerability in place. So this this final final penetration test would help secure, uh, well, affirm your security posture of the solution. And with that, you can finally put it into production and know that you're safe for the time being. Um, I have a, a DevSecOps model there. It's basically uh, SDLC with security integrated into every single stage. Um, secure, verify, uh, defend, and analyze. So it, it, it's, a rep it's a repetitive process. And for anybody who is interested, I have linked a SANS um, article for SDL SSDLC. Um, I also have this. Is, so the SANS one is just a, a, a maybe a 15, 20 minute read for someone who wants just a brief introduction. For anybody who is really interested, um, I've given the US Department of Homeland Security link. And uh, this is, the, so the details in this are actually deprecated, they're built old, um, but it is a solid read. It will take you a solid two hours to actually go through all of this, all of the information in that, slide, in that link. So if you want to actually go through all of it, I'd say that's that's an amazing way to start. Right. Well, um, so that was DevSecOps, right? So that's where every single activity has. Uh, could I share the presentation? Is the presentation not visible? Sorry, Kishore, uh, could you just confirm if you can actually see the presentation on screen? Yes. Yeah, 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 yes, it's there. Okay, uh, so for anybody who wants the presentation, 
like four later access I'll share that again our comments are if you can share that with the participants at a later stage. Um so it's just so that they have access to the links and everything. Yes, yes, we will we will. Okay, so um but I've talked about DevSecOps where you integrate security into every single stage that's possible. Now that's the ideal scenario, right? But it's not always the case. Companies may not have a security architect who is work who can actively work with developers and uh, like your your test personnel. So that is where most of these other activities would come in. Uh, I'm going to start with vulnerability assessment. So what is a vulnerability? It is a weakness in your solution. Uh, when I make, when I say solution, it can be anything. It can be your mobile app, um, network, web app. Uh, infrastructure, it could be a server, a database, whatever, what have you. Um, so that that's a vulnerability. Now, just to make it clear, vulnerability assessment is not a, uh, a substitute for penetration testing. So the whole point of vulnerability assessment is you put something in front of you. So let's say you have a um, I don't know, uh, a football in front of you, right? Just by looking at it, you can tell, okay, so the ball is inflated, uh, there's no leaks. If there are leaks, you spin the ball around, see where the, leak, where the leak is coming from, and then you go, you put a circle around it and go, okay, so that's there. The, the puncture is small, medium, large, whatever. So you identify. So vulnerability assessment is only for identification and uh, basically gives a an impact uh, analysis, basically. So it, let's say you have website A again, your fancy new website, um, and you run a vulnerability assessment against that website. Uh, and your scan comes back with five high findings, two medium, one low. That's that's okay, that's, that's not too bad. That's still not great, but it still has five high findings, right? So ha the things that you need to identify here is, so you have five findings, so the number one, two, the actual rating. So it's a high rated finding. How did you find that? How, how did you find out that it's a high? Well, you obviously have your, your databases across the world. You have standards that basically define how, um, define uh, how these would impact you, uh, a customer or a company if they're exploited. So based on that, you uh, the vulnerabilities are given a rating. And obviously you have the vari variations of these of these findings. So there's XSS, there's uh, insecure cipher space being, or yeah, TLS, SSL, insecure cipher space being used, Rails 1.0 being used, uh, potential different kinds of attacks that can be carried out. So all, there, there, you would be able to get a granular view of all the all the potential holes in your solution, right? Um, now, like I said, it's not a, a substitute for penetration testing. Now, but what a vulnerability assessment can do is it can be used to feed this information into penetration testing. Now, um, on the right side here, I've given the types of vulnerability scans. So you, you look at uh, popular ports, you look at your hosting, uh, you do a quick scan, basically looks for uh, your OWASP top 10 and any popular vulnerabilities. You have your, uh, yeah, like I said, the top uh, OWASP top 10, you have your PCI compliance checks, PCI for those of you who don't know, payments card industry. That is a standard that all financial sectors or any system that um, accepts payment Will need to will need to follow. I think I don't know. Yeah, there's there's definitely logs against uh, companies not following PCI DSS compliance, and obviously, like I said, health information is really important. The highest level of um, classification is given to health information, so it basically runs a check for your applications against all of these, and it gives back a report, and you can use this report for a penetration test. Um, similar to the other one, other slide, I've given a short and long read. A short read, uh, Guide to Vulnerability Assessment. It's a security intelligence um, web, uh, website. Uh, it's it's a quick half an hour read if you want just a initial start. And for those of you who want a little more information on cloud 
uh, vulnerability assessment and compliance checks. I have a Dome 9 um, security rookie linked on there. This is so Dome 9 is, is a compliance check tool for AWS and Azure and uh, any other cloud solutions. Uh, it, it's a, it's really extensive if you want to if you want to spend a couple of days reading that. I would say go for it. You would come out uh, knowing a lot more than you do now, which is, again, always great. Uh, uh, also, one last thing. Some of the vulnerability assessment tools that can be used, and Nessus, Qualys, Nmap, Dome 9. There's NetSparker, and there's a few more that I'm completely forgetting, but these are the mo more popular ones. Um, and Nmap and uh, and Weaponesses are basically free. You can find it online. It should be fairly straightforward. And Qualys, the actual Qualys module itself, needs uh, money to, to use. It's it's a paid service. But if you go to SS, if you Google SSL Labs, so it's S S L L A B S, um, you will get a a free online vulnerability scan, um, not a vulnerability scanner, but a web application scanner. So you can. Uh, you, you can go there and try out your most frequently visited websites and put that on there and see what you get back with. Right, moving on. Expectation versus reality. We've all heard of the term hackers. Um, so for, for from based on movies and shows and everything, the right left side is what we all expect a hacker to be. But based on the video that was shown earlier, that girl was just, it's, it's an, she's an everyday person. She could be you, she could be me, nobody knows. It could be just an office worker who's sitting at their desk who doesn't necessarily fit the stereotypical role that's portrayed for hackers, right? The reason why I brought that up now is because penetration testing is done by hackers. Um, when I say hackers, they are ethical hackers. Uh, ethical meaning, you know, you, you abide by the law, you are certified, and you do these hacking based on the request of a of a company or of of an entity. So, if I own a company and I want to find out what um, holes my company has or the solution that my company uses has, I want somebody who is certified, who is knowledgeable, and has a good reputation. Um, in, in the actual hacking field to actually test my systems and tell me what are the holes that are present and what can be done to actually remediate them. So it's carried out by certified ethical hackers. Now, certified ethical hackers doesn't necessarily mean somebody with just a CEH certification. There's OSP, there's Security Plus, there's tons of certification that can be done. But the more important requirement is skills. Um, I'll jump between these uh, two sections in the slide if you don't mind. So moving on to the skills slide, skill side, you obviously need to know what exactly ethical hacking is. So when you talk about ethical hacking, it's always to do with um, sure, you know, your your hacking systems and whatnot based on request alone and not done by yourself, and you need to abide by laws. Um, because hacking um, in almost every country, unless if it's done outside of a request, it's illegal. Like that's plain and simple. In your house, if you hack into your, I don't know, parents or your sibling's phone or laptop, that's illegal. That is a jailable offense. So that that core concept needs to be understood. And obviously, there, like I said, there, it's not just certifications alone. Is uh, there's uh, you need to have a decent understanding, well, a amazing understanding of Kali Linux and how to use it. Um, now that mobile is basically everywhere, you need to be you need to be well aware of uh, mobile hacking techniques. You need to be good at social engineering. So social engineering, for those of you who don't know, is um, is what the girl did at the beginning of the video. She sent a Facebook message to somebody saying, hey, do you remember me? Even though she does not know who she is, uh, who the other person is, the complete random a person. But it's basically information gathering. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. Um, for example, um, let's say you're sitting in a room and you are, at, you are on your laptop, you're accessing some website with credentials. There could be somebody sitting right behind you who is looking over your shoulder 
and is taking notes of whatever um, password that they're typing in. That is also a type of social engineering. It's called shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing, sorry. Just a second. Um, obviously, you need to know um, OWASP top 10 and the non top 10 vulnerabilities. You need to be able to use a vulnerability scanner like Nmap and a few other um, tools, Wireshark. There's FDK, which I haven't mentioned here. So you, you should have your skill set should be fairly diverse and extensive. Um, now, coding obviously is also one of the requirements, but if you know your way around most of these tools, you don't even need uh, that level of coding. So that, that's that's one of the main points that I want to drive in. That girl in the video, she was saying, she's not someone who's, who wears a hoodie, sits at night, uh, tried to code a, a piece of software together and then crack passwords and everything. You don't need all that. Like, sure, it would, be, it would help because you need to know what exactly you're doing. But if you are a beginner, and you have a, a base level knowledge of coding, you can just use packages that are already existing. But you need to know what these what these applications do. For example, if, if you are downloading an application on your Jivita, yes, uh, like I was saying, there it is it is necessary, but you can still make do with special specializations in these other tools. So it is. A base level is needed, but but not extensive knowledge is what I'm saying. But again, it, it doesn't stop there. You need to obviously, if you want to become a good ethical hacker, you need to know really. You need to be really good at coding. Um, sorry, I, like I was saying, uh, it, let's say you download an app. Oh, sorry, sorry, my screen time. Um, let's say you're downloading an application onto your system, and that application wants to run as an administrator every time. You need to ask why is that doing? Why why is it doing that? Why does a Notepad, for example, need to run as an administrator? It shouldn't. If it does need to run as an administrator, then there's something wrong with that application, and it is trying to get system privileges, which you shouldn't be giving to any most of the applications because it doesn't need it. If it's a Notepad, it shouldn't have access to my my OS files. It shouldn't have access to my personal files. It should just Act as a word, uh, as a as a uh, as a word pad or a notepad, and nothing else. Um, so, so that's that that covers the skills required for like jumping back onto the left side of the slide. Um, it's usually penetration testing is usually carried out by third party. So, when I mean by third party, uh, when I when I say third party, I mean someone outside of your organization. Because let's say you are building a application or a tool you have a bias towards that because you built it. According to you, the code that you've written is good. But it may not be the case. So if you look at the code again and again, you're still going to look at the same thing and go, yeah, that's that's right. That, that is the exact same thing. Um, but if somebody else from outside comes in and you give them permission to test your application, they will go, wait, that's not how that's supposed to be. That is not secure. And they will point that out and they will uh, exploit it for the sake of um, giving you a demonstration, and they will tell you, uh, they will provide you with recommendations on how it can be fixed. So that, that is why we need somebody outside your organization to come in and, and do these tests. Uh, again, for anybody who is doing computer science engineering, this should be a familiar topic to you because this should have been covered as part of either, I think, end of third year or in fourth year. But it, it, it is uh, there is a really good uh, valid example for this. Uh, or valid reason for this. Um, output of a test will be fed to the dev, build, and maintenance teams for remediation. Now, your dev and build team um, is applicable when your system isn't live. So they can basically go, OK, so I have this output from this test. And they've called out x, y, and z findings. Uh, I need to remediate this. And they've given you recommendations on how to fix it. So that's great. But what do you do when your system is already live? Um, you go to your maintenance teams who are, or management teams who manage these applications or solutions, and they will need to fix them uh, in their test environment. Once that's fixed, push that into production environment. So that, that's that's basically the 
the need and the use of a penetration test. Um, and one thing that I do want to call out is uh, vulnerability, vulnerability assessment. It is only to identify, whereas the pen test will actively exploit. Now, when I say exploit, do you remember that ball example I told you? Let's say you have a football in front of you. You find out where the holes are. Now, when, when I say exploit, you see, you know where the holes have been marked. And you basically take a knife, stab that through, tear, tear open the ball. Now, you have exploited. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. For anybody asking, I will share this uh, presentation with the participants of the later, later stage once the presentation is done. Um, sorry, going back to the ball example, you have used a tool or a knife to use that all existing puncture mark to rip open the ball. So that is exploitation. Um, now, there is different types of penetration teams. Now, there's different types of penetration tests. Uh, so again, web application testing, there's mobile application testing, um, network um, assessment, infrastructure assessment, internal and external assessment. There's your firewall assessment, all those good stuff, right? So that all depends on the technology that's being looked at. That's fine and good, and they all have different methods. And anybody who wants to read more, um, you can find so much information online. Um, like I, That's basically why I haven't provided a link for this. Um, you type in penetration testing or ethical hacker or skills required, you will come across all the information that you need. Uh, but something that isn't really known is the types of penetration testing teams. Um, so there's red team, blue team, and purple team. Red team is, um, uh, the first time I came across this, I thought it was fascinating. So let's say you have company A. Um, company A has its solution, has its secure solutions in place, all good. Uh, you know, you have your building security in place. That's also good. But how would you know that it's actually secure? What a red team does is basically you don't tell anybody that these these testers are going to start. They're going to start uh, attacking your company. So when I say attacking, it's not like physical assault. But what they try to do is they'll try to social engineer their way into your building. They'll try to see if they can swipe somebody's card uh, to get into the building, see if they can get access to places that they shouldn't. And see if uh, the network, uh, the internal network can be joined without having to use a, a proper AD credential. Um, see if it's, if it's an open network, see if it's flat network, if it's segregated. If it is segregated, then which of the rooms have access to these different systems and things like that. And obviously, this also includes um, things like, so let's say you're sitting at your desk at your work. Uh, you need to go to the restroom, you have your laptop open, you have a bunch of sensitive documents on your table, you leave your laptop unlocked, walk away. E this is a perfect opportunity for someone to come in, access their system, and basically get in any information they want as long as you're not back. So all these things are weaknesses, these are security weaknesses. So the purpose of the red team is to basically act as an actual malicious entity and and, and call out all of these in a report to the company at the end of this attack. So you would know, okay, so there is severe um, lack in security when it comes to building security or personal awareness, things like that. So it helps uh, uh, it helps simulate a real world scenario. Blue team is basically, it's our internal defense team, so your security operations. Uh, anybody who is protecting your applications, your networks, your uh, your um, monitoring teams, incident response, people like that. So they they comprise of blue teams. Purple team, um, they, I want to call them a bridge, basically. Um, they take the input from the red team. So it, it calls out every single vulnerability that has been identified by the red team and then uses that to feed into into the blue team so that they can increase their defense. So it's it's basically a bridge between red and blue. Um, I've I shared a link, Daniel Maisler, uh, difference between red, blue, and purple teams. It's it's a quick read. It's a half an hour, one hour read if you want to go through it. 
this um I, i'm gonna admit i stole this picture from google so sorry about that uh, but i thought this was the best representation of a penetration test process so the first thing you need to do is define a scope uh, a scope basically is you are telling the testers what he he or she can or cannot test so because uh, a lot of the times if you let somebody into a network they can basically access a lot of other systems that they shouldn't be accessing so you need to make sure that they are aware of what exactly needs to be tested and everything else that is out of scope and then information gathering so same thing once you connect to the network you do your vulnerability scans you know run an nmap um, uh, nmap um, on a server uh, run an ss scan on a bunch of other servers for the infrastructure assessment um yes yeah, so and the red team is also ethical hacking because they are they again have skills needed to actually do these kinds of assessments and they are bound by law like they're not doing it illegally um right sorry going back to this information gathering um information gathering and enumeration basically melds into one because you're you're still trying to get information uh, but enumeration would include your vulnerability scanning as well and fingerprinting identifying what web servers you're running what os your servers are and things like that uh, vulnerability identification um, i will actually two three and four combines together my bad uh, so once you identify you move on to actually uh, researching what can be done with those vulnerabilities and then you exploit them once these have been exploited you record everything on your side what you found how you found it what did you do to exploit it? And um, is it safe for us to use crack files for application? No, uh, Amrut, it is not safe. I would not recommend it. Um, I'll get back to I'll get into that at a later stage, not now. But it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a recommended approach. Uh, analysis and reporting. Um, so analysis and reporting. It um, basically calls out what was identified, how was it identified, uh, how was it exploited. Um, and what can be done to remediate this vulnerability so that's penetration testing so whatever i've discussed so far that's um those are preventive measures right so you identify something uh, and then try to fix it but what happens if somewhere if someone actually breaks into your system well that's where incident response and digital forensic investigation comes in so incident response is um let's say for anybody who's watched the TV show, Mr. Robot, they would know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, incident response is where, let's say your company is hacked or attacked, your, your, uh, your, your IDS and IPS will start ringing bells, your uh, antivirus and whatever would start ringing alarms, and a team will be dispatched to actually carry out a, 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 a first response analysis. That would be the incident response team. Uh, Stafford, nice. I see you watch the show. Um, so that they they'd be your first response team. They're like your firemen. If the building's on fire, you need somebody there immediately to put it out. That's the incident response team. So they come in, disconnect all systems from from the network, at least, and find out what ex uh, what exactly is the problem. So you identify what's happened, and see see if it can be mitigated, right? So once the, once that's done, um, sorry, I, I, I forgot this one part. They need to be, so it cannot be just penetration testers. So yes, ethical hackers will have the skills needed for this, but you also need to have proper analysis skills and you need to be able to carry out investigations. So you're almost like a, a detective at this stage. Right, so that's where that's the kind of skills that you'd need for incident response and digital forensic investigation. So once your incident response teams gets the initial information, they 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 do a quick check and find out what's pro what's the problem, what caused it, if possible, and what systems have been affected. What is the impact? Um, so that would be the role of incident response. And the, the follow up would be okay so the attack has happened incident response has come in they've 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 uh, identified all these things now what in cases where you cannot find out uh, immediately what the actual root cause is 
digital forensic experts come through. They comb through network logs, device logs. So when I say device logs, it's not just your 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 computers. I'm talking about your servers, your database, your network, any log that they can find, any system that they can find. They'll go through all of these logs, and even if they need supporting information, then they will also need to go through file systems. So when I say file systems, I'm sure most of you would have seen XFAT, NTFS, FAT, things like that. So they need to comb through uh, raw file system um, images, basically, to to find out the root cause, to identify the root cause. Now, why is this needed? Uh, why can't we just go? Okay, so we found out what exactly happened. Why can't we just you know cut that piece out of our lives and move on? Well, you need to you need to be able to improve your response. So let's say your attack happens today. You don't want the same attack to happen tomorrow and not have a response for it. So once the forensic teams go through all this information and identify and carry out the root cause analysis, you should be able to use that to bolster your current security posture. So that, that's, that's basically the role of incident response and a digital forensic anal analyst. DLP. Um, I'm sorry if it's if it's uh, it's a little more than an hour, so I'll try to. I just have a few more slides here, and uh, uh, hopefully I, I can wrap up fairly soon. Uh, what is DLP? Data loss prevention. Um, if anybody who's working now, you would have probably uh, noticed that your company's laptop uh, will not have its USB port um, available, so you wouldn't be able to use a USB stick to copy information. Hopefully. And uh, things like you wouldn't be able to share any sensitive document to your personal email, things like that. So that's data loss prevention, where a company implements controls to make sure that uh, no sensitive information is accidentally or intentionally sent outside of your organization. Because you don't want things like a penetration test report to be made available to other companies, because that is your sensitive information. You don't want others to know what kind of holes you have in your system. So that's that's the whole point of a DLP uh, being in place. Uh, again, uh, if you want to give a quick read of the slide, um, or I can share that later with you. Uh, I see Kumran sent out a, uh, a note saying that if you want the slide, please um, send a mail and uh, he'd, be, he'd be glad to share it. But that, that's basically what a DLP is. It's, called, it's data loss prevention and it's it's so one of the most important things that, that a lot of companies don't seem to be following. And last, um, I know, that, like I said, there there's too many topics to cover, but this is the one that I wanted to cover the most, uh, to, even, even if it is towards the end, and that's cyber awareness. Now, yes, I am talking about, I'm talking from the perspective of somebody who has been interested in the cybersecurity field for a couple of years. I've read up a ton. Uh, I've spoken to like industry experts and all that, but it doesn't necessarily mean cybersecurity is only for people like me or people who are in computer science or IT. Cyber awareness should be a common common knowledge at this stage to everybody, because everybody has phones, everybody has a laptop, everybody uses public Wi-Fi. You go to your whatever bookstore or coffee store, or your mall, you have open you have open Wi-Fi's that you connect to, and you you uh, you use your various applications through that. Now, it, it isn't uh, like sorry. Uh, what I want to say is, it shouldn't be just up to the experts to actually know what shouldn't be done. Now, obviously, when it comes to things like SSDLC, that's all that's all restricted to people who actually do those things. But for everyday users, people like you and me, our parents, our siblings, friends, whoever, you should know that um, there are certain things that you shouldn't do. So for some of the examples I've called out here is, uh, don't use the same password for multiple accounts. So if you have three emails, don't use the same password. It And uh, obviously I, sh it, I shouldn't have to say this in 2020, but don't use password or password one as your password. That is the most common password in the world, and I guarantee you it will be compromised. And for anybody who wants to know if their um, if their email has been compromised, I can 
I can share a link with you where you can basically find out if your account has been compromised. And there we go. So if you go to have it been pwned, enter your email ID and hit enter. Uh, it'll basically say if your password has been leaked or not. Uh, can I explain the word shady? Uh, the easiest way to put this is suspicious. Uh, suspicious uh, or there's there's a hundred ads pop up popping up when you go to a website. That is the definition of shady. It doesn't look okay. You know, you know there's something wrong at the back of your head. You know there it, there is something off, but you don't know what. So if that is the case, just just stay away. Just just leave the website because that um, linking back to my cross uh, cross site scripting example, just by visiting a website, you could be victim to an attack. So unless you have a no link received. Um, I'm not sure if everybody will be able to see that. Right, I'll I'll try and get that shared separately as well. Um, sorry, uh, linking back to my um, cross-site scripting example, just by visiting a website, you could be under attack. So don't use the same password for multiple accounts. Stop using unsecure Wi-Fi, like free Wi-Fi. Uh, use a VPN if you can. There's there's a lot of loads of free VPNs out there. Try to use that to secure a connection. Uh, if a website or apps looks shady or doubtful, uh, it probably is. Just you know, don't, don't don't risk it. Your personal information is not worth whatever you're trying to trying to get out of that website. Um, some of the other things that I haven't mentioned here is um, use a antivirus software. Just the the best advice that I can give: use an antivirus software. Uh, try to keep your Windows or your Mac or whatever up to date. Same with your phones. If you receive a software update, update it. Uh, it it's best to have a couple of uh, megabytes of data used up than to potentially fall victim to cybercrime. Um, so that's that's all of it um, for my presentation. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more topics that that could be covered here, but. As it is, I've I've spent more than an hour trying to cover just these these five six topics. So um, that's that's it for my presentation. Uh, if, if anybody has any questions, I, I know there were quite a few that came through. So if come on, sir, if you want to open up the chat for questions. Yes, 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 sir. Um, so we have received a number of questions. Uh, the, the first question: uh, How to become an ethical hacker? What are the skills required? All right. So uh, I covered this to an extent uh, during the presentation. So um, obviously, uh, I see there is one more. Sorry, sir. Uh, I see one more question that came in uh, asking if I could teach ethical hacking, even though I am a certified um, ethical hacker. No, I cannot teach you. Uh, that is, I can teach you the necessary skills, but uh, I wouldn't be able to give you the certification. So you need to go through. Um, I think the most Famous one is EC Council. They're the they're the they're, they're the body that they're, they're the governing body who can actually give you a certification. Now, obviously, it does take money to actually study and take up an exam to actually get the certification. But once you do, it's it's an amazing stepping stone into the cybersecurity world. So, skill sets required. Um, I don't know if I can actually go back into the actual presentation. There, uh, the 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 box on the right that would cover most of it. Um, like I said, you do need a some level of knowledge of coding, but it isn't. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to know your way around these topics that I've mentioned here. Right. Uh, any other questions, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what are the ways in which uh, we can protect ourselves? Is there uh, frequently used web publications vulnerable? How could we identify this? Uh, could you please explain? Uh, absolutely. So uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll answer this in parts, I guess. So how can you secure yourself? Um, I covered this in the cyber awareness topic. Um, use a, use an antivirus. Um, I know there's a, quite a few out there. The the more the most of them are are expensive. Uh, not expensive. They they do cost money, and 
I know it's it's not exactly an ideal scenario, um, but if you can buy Norton or Avast or whatever, there is a free one called Malware Bytes. I, I I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to look at that. These guys, they're fairly decent. It's free. Um, it, it works fairly well. And their their uh, signature database is updated frequently, so it's it's really good. And uh, commonly used websites that are vulnerable, no. So this is one of the points that I touched upon. Um, the most commonly used websites are YouTube, your your Google, your Facebook, WhatsApp, or WhatsApp Web, Twitter, uh, things like websites like these. No, um, most of them are very secure because obviously their their user base is so large that if something does happen, they would be in a lot of trouble with a lot of countries. So a lot of the popular websites that's, that's used on an everyday basis, they're actually pretty secure because they, they make sure that their systems are tested again and again and again, and uh, they, they keep to keep up to date with whatever information that comes out of um, the cybersecurity world. So popular websites, no, you're, I think you're good to go there. Um, the not so popular ones, I would keep my eye out. And how can you identify them? So there is a just a second. I'm just pulling up a links. Yeah, there we are. There. So I've shared a link in uh, in the chat. It's called SSL Labs. It is really good. Uh, you can you can enter uh, whichever um, application web application that you're using onto that uh, onto that URL page URL bar, and it would scan that website and find out if there's anything uh, overtly um, or um, obviously wrong about it and it also gives the website uh, website a grade uh, if it's a b or c whatever uh, the the better the grade the better the security posture hopefully that answers all of those questions sorry if i missed out any on that uh Shisham, can you unmute your uh, video uh, sure sorry yeah so the next question uh, is there any uh, difference uh, with uh, network security cyber security and information security in working Yes, definitely yes. Um, so, w w like I said, cybersecurity is ba think of it as the as a central king, and you have all of these other components that feed into it to actually, you know, um, compose cybersecurity. Um, information security mainly focuses on the protection of information. So, let's say you are. I don't know, a data owner, you have XYZ files on your system on a, which is on a server. You want to make sure that those files are protected because those are your files. And let's say you've uh, classified them as confidential. So you are only five or six people are allowed to access that file. You want to make sure that those files are protected. They are accessible to whoever is supposed to be accessing them. And uh, they remain the same. So that what I mean by that is, nobody else should be able to update them. So let's say you have a document in place and whatever content you have in there is the only content that's supposed to be there. So nobody else should be able to come in, edit that file and go, this is the new file. This is what it should be, which shouldn't be the case because you are the data owner, you own that file. So that's that's uh, integrity, basically. It, it make, make, making sure the content of the file is the same. Um, so it, it, this is... Uh, covered by a triangle called CIA, CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, this is covered, this is the basis of information security. Whoever's, um, if anybody's done, um, uh, I think it was fourth year module, I can't remember, but it, it, it should be in engineering. The CIA triangle is covered there. Uh, for any, If anybody wants to give a quick read, I would say freshen up on that. Exactly, CIA triad. There we go, thank you. Um, so, so that's information security. Network security is, uh, while yes, it does facilitate the protection of these files, it is 
it, it's a very small part, but the, the main focus would be to protect your actual network itself. So like I said, uh, if you remember what I, when I was talking about, when I was talking about uh, red teaming, they tried to see if they can access your network, see if they can uh, connect to other systems across uh, the network, see if it's a flat network, things like that. So um, yeah, so make sure that there is no malware entering your system through intrusion detection systems or intrusion prevention systems. Uh, make sure you have a network-based firewall if you don't have host-based firewalls on your system. So when I say host-based firewalls, I mean uh, when you install a antivirus on your actual device, so on your laptop, that's a host-based firewall. Um, a network-based firewall would basically think of it as a birdcage and the firewall would, uh, or not firewall, um, networks, network based antivirus, my bad. Uh, but uh, network based um, uh, antivirus would basically prevent malware from entering the network, whereas a host based would be preventing the malware from entering your system. So that is basically the difference between cybersecurity, information security, and network security. Do we have any, any other questions, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have. Uh, uh, what should we do when our details are hacked? Uh, what should we do? When that, uh, how can we know that our details are hacked? All right. So, for your details having been hacked, uh, for your email alone, I've shared with shared the Have I Been Pwned website with you. Uh, you can you can check um, if your actual uh, e if your email credentials have been have been disclosed outside, so that's one. Um, how would you know if your, um, for example, your banking account has been compromised? One, most financial institutions have a really really robust anti fraud system. So what that means is, um, obviously, you need to be make sure you need to make sure that uh, any messages that you do receive from the bank, if it's about a transaction, that you know that you it's something that you've made. So let's say you purchase something online for 500 rupees today and you get a message about it, that's fine. But tomorrow you don't buy anything, but you still get another 500 rupees uh, having been used to purchase something that you haven't done. One, um, contact your bank or if you have uh, internet banking, check to see if that reflects on your account. If there is multiple entries on there, if it is, that's bad. That's a bad indication. Um, sorry, uh, I was just reading one of the chats. Um, two, contact your bank. Tell them I've received this message. What is it about? If it's a charge that they've done internally, they need to give you a proper reason for it. If not, they will they will start their they'll start their whole process that they have in place to make sure that they they'll freeze your account number one um, so that no more money goes out. And they'll start their investigation, so the whole instant response and um, potentially forensic experts would come in. That's for that's for that one specific question. Yeah, this is a question from Arun. Uh, uh, how the data loss has been prevented in the WFHS process, uh, which is the current uh, security uh, situation of every company? Sorry, sir, could you say that again? Did you say WFH process? Uh, uh, so, Arun, uh, Arun uh, uh, just again type what, what it is, uh, WFH process. And this other question, uh, how could we trust an employee that uh, he or she won't steal the data or leak? Uh, uh, yeah, so this is this is one of the one of the first things. Um, this is the, one of the first things that I did ask uh, my employer when I when I started. So basically, every well, most companies ideally should have this thing called a pest control pre-employment screening. So you let's say you are hiring an employee, you need to find out who they are, their their qualification and their past work details. If anybody's moved for moved um, between different companies, you would know what I'm talking about. But that would that, that would basically say, okay, so this person has worked in this business company without any incidents and they are reliable and they can they, they should be good to go. And obviously in any company that um, that you work at where you handle sensitive information, there's always a risk that some employee will be 
will get fed up and they'll do something. And each company will have a built-in control in that. I think that that's that's an um, inherent fraud risk. So that it's it's one of the controls that's in place. But yeah. And uh, sorry, I don't work from home process. Um, right. So uh, I, 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 again, I've only recently um, started started working in the in the actual field. So what I can say, based on my experience and what I've seen from other like the other people from different companies that I work with is uh, a lot of the times your personal device, the company doesn't really have any control over. It's always, again, it's a, it's an inherent risk that's always there. Um, but if, if you have a company provided laptop, uh, good chances that they're, you're using a, a VPN solution, a remote access solution, which basically um, uses to put in layman terms, it forms a tunnel. Uh, it for, yeah, it forms a tunnel to make sure that all your traffic is routed through your web proxy, which inspects uh, every information that you're sending out, and uh, make sure that any organization-related information is sent to only where it's supposed to be sent. So, for example, like I said, as part of a DLP control, there are policies, DLP policies that are put in place in the um, web proxies, where if you try to send out a report, for example, that nobody else should be reading except your company employees, that would be quarantined and you would be marked as a problem, uh, saying this person has tried to send out sensitive information from our company to his personal email or another competitive company, whatever. So that th there are controls that are in place, but obviously when it comes to uh, workplaces which employ bring your own device. So if you can use your own mobile phone for your work and for your personal needs, that, that again, that's an inherent risk that the companies would need to would need to accept if they are implementing BYOD. So this is a question from Pangesh Kumarja, a French cybersecurity expert and ethical hacker who goes by the name Elliot Anderson, uh, uh, flagged security issues within the RQ Sedu app. The hacker alleged that the security issue puts data of 90 million Indian at risk. Elliot had tweeted saying, a security issue has been found in your app. Is this possible to hack uh, this app and uh, how the hackers access the user data from the centralized server? Right. Um... <laughs> Right. Okay. 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 So, if if this has or if this vulnerability has been publicly disclosed, good chances that that application has already been fixed. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, is it possible to hack this app? Um, yes, assuming that these this vulnerability that he is talking about is still existing, and uh, whoever is the hacker knows exactly how to exploit that vulnerability, because just knowing that uh, system is vulnerable doesn't really help you. For example, everybody's heard of how when Zoom became really popular, everybody was, was coming out with stories of how the application was weak. But the problem is, not a lot of people know how to exploit that app. So, it, it yes, it is possible if the if the vulnerability is open, and how the access access the user data from centralized server. This is... Oof, um, SQL injection is is my main one. If there is if if the if there isn't enough uh, isn't there if if there isn't proper input validation in place, and if your application can take um, user user inputs in the form of uh, SQL scripts, then that would be a way to extract information from the server because if the server looks at that script, looks at the command, and goes, oh, okay, that's a that's an SQL query. Here's all this information of all these users, I don't know if it's you, but keep it. Again, that depends on whether, what kind of vulnerability that this application actually has in place. So hopefully, I, I know it's a bit vague, but hopefully that answers most of your question. Okay, uh, the next question, do uh, CTFs really help gain a better understanding of the real world scenario, or is it better to complete course with labs? Yeah, okay. Uh, Stafford, I see you're probably in the field itself. So um, to answer your question, absolutely. CTFs are 
one of the best ways to to get real world experience. I, I wouldn't call it real world, but it, it is a really good exposure where you basically get to use your skills to try and achieve an, an objective. Um, is it better to complete courses with labs? Again, that, that basically, they act in tandem where let's say you're in a CTF and you're doing a bunch of activities and you get stuck at one point. Take, take in, bring in a course with a lab activity, which would potentially have your answer to this solution. So yes to both, uh, because they, they can work in tandem. They can support each other in, in cases where you may be stuck. Um, but I wouldn't say one is better over the other. I, I would say both are equally essential. So when my system is hacked, uh, what can you do? When a system is hacked, what can you do? If you're in a company and if your server is in, in question, unplug it from the network. Um, disconnect all cables, you know, don't, don't like make sure it's isolated, make sure nobody can access that server physically and digitally. Um, and obviously once your instant response teams comes in, your security, um, um, your network security personnel would have already been able to comb through the log and or collect the logs and give you that information or give the incident response team the information that they and that the IR team would need. Um, so they, they'd be able to start going through it, but the immediate response is unplug your system, disconnect it, shut it down. Okay, uh, thank you, Sriram. Uh, we have of uh, more number of questions uh, in the chat <laughs> box. Okay, uh, we'll stop here. Uh, uh, I request all the participants to complete the feedback process. Uh, if you have any uh, queries, uh, you can send through the uh, mail so that we will uh, try to answer uh, all these uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sriram, for spending time with us in your busy schedule. I know Absolutely. how busy you are uh, yes. talking uh, to you for the past two weeks. I oh, hope yeah. everyone enjoyed the session. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the admirable uh, presentation. On behalf of Jaya Group of Intuition uh, and all uh, participants, once again, uh, thank you, Sriram. Uh, at this juncture, uh, I place my thanks to all my uh, the college management and the colleagues uh, for their uh, uh, constant support uh, for uh, conducting this uh, webinar series. Uh, so tomorrow we have a schedule uh, at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, the topic: uh, Project Lifecycle Management: uh, How Computer Programs Transform the Real World Engineering Problem. Uh, by uh, Mrs. Uh, Malini Sandanum, uh, who is uh, Deputy Manager uh, the Project Lifecycle Management at uh, Webco India. Uh, uh, thank you all uh, for your active participation. Thank you, one and all. We will meet again by tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, until then, uh, signing off, uh, this is Professor Kumaranya. Uh, thank you, Sriram. Uh, thank you, all participants. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.